everybody, we're going to get started with our special session on polar ocean and sea ice interactions. Um, so I'm very pleased to be hosting this session. Uh, before we get started with the speakers, I'd especially like to thank Jamie Morrison, who helped me put it together, uh, especially when I was out at sea just at the time we were trying to um, locate uh, suitable invited speakers. So we have four invited speakers today, and the purpose of this session is to bring together people who are involved in looking at ice in the sea ice in the Antarctic and in the Arctic from both observational and modeling perspectives, uh, to think about the questions of uh, what it is that, uh, how, in what ways do the ocean and sea ice interact um, in the two different uh, hemispheres, and um, how can we better monitor these interactions, what processes are involved, how can we uh, better parameterize these processes in climate models, and how can we improve our predictions of uh, sea ice and ocean interaction. So our speakers are Ron Kwok from NASA JPL, um, who will be talking about observations in the Arctic, uh, Julian Strove from University College London and uh, NSIDC, who will be talking about uh, uh, modeling of sea ice in the Arctic, Alec Petty from University of Maryland and NASA GS GSFC, who will be talking about observations in the Antarctic, and Aaron Donahue from University of Washington, who will be talking about modeling in the Antarctic. So we're going to start first with Ron Kwok. Uh, Ron also showed this uh, movie that you just saw of... Um, uh, buoys in the Arctic um, embedded in the sea ice, and now we're going to hear more about observations in the Arctic. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here. <clears throat> I've, I've actually never given a dinner talk before. So it's either, it's either a fundraiser or I have to be entertaining. So it's going to be a fundraiser. So, <laughs> so Mike's going to go around with baskets to the program managers, and you expect it to contribute to the uh, U.S. CLIVA program, right? So, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about observations of the Arctic Ocean, and uh, my favorite topic uh, it's fun to talk about because the ice is very complex and it's very difficult to to observe, make observations, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about two different things uh, in particular, uh, ice thickness and ice drift. And you saw that movie earlier, and that was uh, <clears throat> a movie made by uh, Norbert Untersteiner, and he was sort of the father of the, the, the U.S. buoy program in the Arctic Ocean. And it started, when was it, Jamie? In the 70s, right? And, and you can see, actually, if you want to see it again later, you can see that the density of buoys get denser and denser as, as the funding goes up <laughs> because uh, there's a lot more interest in the Arctic uh, later in the 80s and 90s, and there are more uh, buoys deployed. And those buoys drift around the Arctic on the ice, and, and they drift out of the Fram Strait, and, and you can see the different, they're highly correlated, the speeds are, and, and you can see... Uh, some of them actually get exported into the Fram Strait and they melt out with the ice. So that's, that was the movie. So, so what I'm going to talk about first is, let's see, <clears throat> what's happening this year. I guess there are, all of us sort of uh, are interested in, in keeping track of what the ice is doing because it's changing so fast. And, in fact, Julian's going to talk a little bit more about it, but I just want to say a few words about, uh, let's see, I'm just use this. Uh, about what's happening this year, where we're at. Uh, so we are sort of in mid-July. So the, the, the panel on the left shows you where we're at compared to the record minimum. So most of the observations that we get are from passive microwave sensors uh, from satellites, and, and that's how, how we map the ice extent. So we're tracking pretty closely uh, to the record minimum, and there are sorts of reasons why we're doing that, but I think Julian's going to stay a few more words about it. So I think it's likely that we'll get another uh, record this year, but I think as we were talking earlier, uh, we're sort of waiting for that storm of death. The storm of death, typically we get this heat stored in the, in the open water leads uh, in the Arctic, and it takes a storm to stir up the ice and it melts the ice very quickly uh, near the end of the season. So. Perhaps we'll get that, perhaps we won't. But uh, 
but uh, I think there are a lot of – there's a, a, a program called CIS Outlook, and, and there are there's sort of projections and, and forecasts of how much ice we're going to get left – that's left over after the summer of smelt. So uh, perhaps Julian will say a few words about that. But there, the variability, as you can see on the right panel, is pretty high. And, and from year to year, from, that's starting from the 1980s, and you can see that the variability from year to year is pretty high. So the, it's, it's in terms of forecast, uh, short-term forecast, it's a very difficult thing to do, even if you start very close to where the minimum uh, is uh, in September. So that's all I want to say about the ice extent. But the two, two main things, so, so the ice extent describes ice coverage, and that's sort of interesting, but there are a lot of things about the Arctic sea ice cover that's also interesting. So one thing is ice thickness. Now, <clears throat> this chart shows the thinning around the Arctic for, uh, since 1958, ever since we started uh, <clears throat> submarine cruises into the Arctic. So, so this is a combination of observations from, from uh, U.S. Navy submarines uh, from 58 to 76 and 93 to 97. And, and after that came the, the altimeters, the light altimeters and the, the radar altimeters, which provided us with uh, the freeboard of the Arctic Ocean, where we use what is what we use to derive ice thickness. And that's how we compute the ice thickness from altimetry. Uh, so I'm not going to say a lot more detail about that. But so this shows five regions in the Arctic Ocean, uh, um, six actually, and I'm not going to go through the details. But you can see, starting in, in the 50s, we were getting pretty thick ice. This is September ice. This is not winter ice. Uh, winter ice is at least a couple of meters thicker. Uh, so, <clears throat> so you can see the dramatic change in the ice thickness since, since that time. Now, if you just go through and average it, you lose about a meter and a half of ice since the uh, 50s and the 60s. A meter and a half of ice is about my height, and, and you typically, uh, in the summer, you get about two, two and a half meters at the end of summer, but uh, for the thick ice, for the, for the early season. But now we are all left with only about half a meter ice starting in September. And so, so we lost quite a bit of ice in terms of thickness as well as volume. So that's, that's the... And the altimeters are giving us okay coverage of the of the ice cover. We don't get uh, every month. Uh, we don't get a monthly estimates. The, the altimeters work perhaps mostly during the frozen uh, freezing season. Uh, during the summer, we have trouble with retrievals, but they're, we're working on how to do that better. So there 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 are uh, gaps in the observations. Uh, and so, so that's sort of a, a, a historic record of what we have so far in terms of coverage of ice thickness. So the other thing is I want to show is the decline in ice volume. Now, ice volume is interesting because you, you store fresh water in the, in the ice uh, and that that's exported. And, and also you, you also have uh, – uh, Heat and volume, basically heat and fresh water, and so this shows the the observations from the satellite period, which combines two different satellites. One is ISAT, and and that's op, that was operated in the campaign mode, uh, a month to two months a year between 2003 and 2008, and CryoSat now is operated 24/7. Basically, we get ice coverage every every orbit, uh, and and so that shows you that the ice cover is this, the, the top field, it's basically a spatial map of ice thickness. So that shows you there, there's quite a bit of contrast in, in thickness distribution from in the Arctic Ocean. You get very thick ice in, in the Arctic, north of Greenland and north of the Ellesmere Island, for you who are familiar with the Arctic. And that's typically uh, a meter or so thicker than the rest of the ice. And the ice thins very quickly over to the Siberian side. And the reason for the thicker ice, uh, one reason is because of it's a different climate, it's much colder up there, 
so it's thermodynamics. The other reason is dynamics. So, <clears throat> so the ice, because of the ice circulation, the ice get pushed up against the Greenland coast and it gets thick, and and that's the, the where you get the thick ice, thickest ice produced in the Arctic Ocean, not by thermodynamic growth, but by by redistribution of ice from the thick categories, thinner categories into the thick categories. That's what we call mechanical redistribution. And so you get, basically when it gets compressed, you, you store a little bit more ice uh, in those areas where you have thick ice. And, and so that's, this shows the, the decline in the volume. So we started up out uh, in the 90s at more than 20,000 cubic kilometers of Arctic ice in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, that's within the Arctic Basin not counting the ice outside the Arctic basin. And so that's, we lost uh, probably, you know, if you look at the winter, probably about six, 7,000 cubic kilometers of ice over, the, over this period. So that's, that's the ice volume. Uh, the, other <clears throat> the other way of looking at the ice cover is the, <clears throat> the multi-ice coverage, how old that ice is. So some ice uh, in the Arctic, survives the summer. So if it's thick enough, uh, then, then it could become second year ice or multi year ice. And this shows, so, so he, this plot shows the change in the old ice cover, uh, all the ice that's older than uh, a summer, uh, basically survived the summer. And, and basically that's the red and the yellow. And the blue ice is basically formed during the season. So that's grown starting from open ocean. And it, so the reason why we're interested in it is because the old ice shows you, in the old days, uh, the residence time of the ice in the, uh, in the Arctic Ocean. Some of the, because of the circulation pattern of the ice in, in the 90s, some of that ice uh, recirculates uh, in the Beaufort Gyre, uh, and it could get up to five, in, in the, on the average, five to six years old. But these days, because of the melt in the Beaufort Sea, most of the ice are uh, relatively young, uh, probably less than a couple of years old. And so this shows you that, that we lost a lot of the ice that we used to call, to label as uh, contributing to the perennial ice covering the Arctic Ocean. And so this is, so we've lost about uh, two million square kilometers. If you just look at the, uh, X axis, Y axis. Uh, so that's significant decrease in, in ice coverage. So that's, that's the sort of quick overview of, of thickness and sort of ice age. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of interest in, 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 the, in the ice age as well as ice thickness for forecasting because if you look at the current uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in forecasts and, and for t using uh, observed ice thickness to initialize models, uh, especially in the uh, 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 late spring and early summer, so that you can get an idea where the ice cover is at during the summer, where the operations are important and, and, and other issues. So that's sort of the uh, ice age and ice thickness story. So the other story I want to tell you is, is about ice motion, uh, which you saw some uh, in, in early on uh, in, in, as a movie, but now we can get, in addition to the buoy drift uh, for looking at ice motion, we can get ice motion from directly from measured, derived from satellites, and we can get daily fields of ice motion. Ice motion is not that good from the low resolution data, but I'll show you some high resolution data, which is actually quite interesting as well. So why is ice drift important? So this is just the mean ice drift between 1992 and 2013. Uh, you can see that clockwise uh, circulation, we call it Beaufort Gyre, and there's the, uh, okay. So there's the transpolar drift which transports ice from Siberian side and out to Fram Strait. So there are a couple of interesting things about it. So, so the changes in the circulation uh, changes the export and regional mass distribution of the ice cover. Uh, and, and, and I'll show you some numbers as to how much ice is actually exported into the Greenland Sea. And, and obviously if you have, uh, ex if you 
evicting ice from where you have thick ice, like north of Greenland, into the Beaufort Sea, it will allow the uh, basically yeah, it will get either it will either melt or it will help uh, preserve the ice cover in the Beaufort Sea, which these days is very unusual. Uh, so, so the ice moves with the wind uh, in general and the ocean. So at the very short time scales, most of the variability can be explained by the wind. But the long time scale is, is part, uh, part ocean and part wind. And, and also the variability of ice motion uh, uh, dictates, basically, it's responsible for the abundance of open water. Now, ice is a solid, so when you, uh, the reason why it moves, it has to fail. And when it fails, it opens up these leads, uh, and, and so it controls the ab abundance of water. So uh, the ice concentration that you see in the winter is mostly driven by the failure of the ice, brittle failure of the solid ice in the, uh, when it moves around because of the large-scale gradient imposed by the, the wind. Uh, and, then, and then obviously that associated with ice deformation, which controls the uh, uh, mechanical re redistribution of ice in the Arctic. So that's why it's important. And so this shows the mean drift uh, on the left, which is part wind, part ocean. And, and we can get now the um, uh, dynamic topography of the ice cover from, from satellites uh, over the ice-covered ocean. So the reason that the way we we get the uh, sea surface height is is by looking through the leads. Uh, we don't map the ice cover. Basically, we look at the the openings, leads, and and measure the sea surface height uh, over the leads. And that's what we actually use for deriving the dynamic topography of the ice cover. And and on the, on on long time scales, basically the the uh, the mean ice drift looks very much like the uh, uh, mean ocean current derived from dynamic topography. So that's on a large scale. So so a few words about ice export. So I so the the sea ice outflow uh, it's it's significant uh, through the Fram Strait. Fram Strait is that narrow passage between Greenland and and uh, Svalbard. Uh, most of that ice. We lose about 10% of the ice area through that passage every year. 10% uh, of the ice cover is about, so the ice cover inside the Arctic Ocean is, covers about 7 million square kilometers. So we lose about 700,000 uh, square kilometers of ice every year uh, in the mean. And, and that corresponds, uh, depending on the thickness of the ice, uh, to, to several thousand cubic kilometers of ice. So at the peak of the uh, export uh, time series, uh, so that shows the, the, the plot on the uh, right shows the time series of ice export between October and September uh, through the growth season uh, between from 78 to 2010. And, and at the peak of the Arctic oscillation uh, where the circulation pattern is in the right place, it was expo it exported about 3,000 cubic kilometers of ice. And for the oceanographer, that's, that's about 0.08 sphere drops of ice coming out of the Arctic Ocean. So you can compare it with, compare it with the, with the uh, liquid part of the ocean coming out as well. I don't remember what the number is, uh, but it's, it's, it's also a big number. So that's, and obviously that has implications in terms of uh, uh, freshwater melt in the in the Greenland Sea, as well as uh, impact on uh, deep convection over there in terms of uh, AMOC. Uh, so that's uh, so we have rough estimates of those uh, over the period, and and it's very dependent on how good the ice motion is, and 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 we're working on improving the these observations so that we can get a better estimates, but. But these days, the ice cover is also much thinner, so the, 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 the actual volume export is, is, is somewhat lower than what we're observing in the, in the 70s and, and 90s. So that's, that's, that's ice export. And the circulation pattern 
of the ice cover is, is sort of a teleconnection, but it's not really because it's the Arctic Oscillation. Uh, it's connected to the Arctic o Oscillation. So the Arctic Oscillation, if you look at composites of ice motion over uh, uh, different phases of the Arctic os Oscillation, uh, you can see when you have high AO, uh, you have a very cyclonic type circulation, which Jamie will talk a little bit more about in terms of ocean circulation. And, in, and when you have negative phase, you have uh, 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 a more cyclonic, any cyclonic circulation. And, and since, so the, the bottom chart uh, panel shows the, the AO, distribution of AO index over the last, uh, since 1980. So we had a very sort of a, a negative phase, and then we had sort of a step up to uh, a positive phase, and now it's sort of coming back down again. And that has implications on what we've been seeing, uh, and Jamie's going to probably say a few words about that as well, uh, because that has interesting implications as far as ocean circulations and, uh, and where, how the fresh water is distributed within the Arctic Ocean. So that's the circulation pattern. And, and so this shows, uh, because the ice cover is thinning, uh, the, the, there's increased mobility of the ice. So the wind hasn't changed much, but the ice itself, if you look at the plot of uh, speed, trend in the drift speed, the ice has uh, increased uh, in terms of speed. And I think our explanation for that, our speculation of why that's happening is because the ice is much thinner, and, and because it's thinner, it's weaker, and it's weaker, it's more mobile. mobile. So that's, that's sort of an explanation, but I think there's also other interesting explanations as well in terms of, you know, because you have to get the momentum on the, into the ice and, and the ocean, and there's some balance that has to work out before you can claim that that's an attribution of the uh, increase in drift speed. Uh, so, so that's, so I have to finish by saying one other thing that's one of my favorite topics is small scale ice motion. So ice motion that you've seen so far is pretty large scale. We're talking about 25 kilometers to hundreds of kilometers. And, and there's large scale correlation in the ice motion because it's correlated to the, the wind field. But because the ice fails, we have lots of cracks uh, in the ice. Ice is sort of in a constant state of failure. Uh, and you have these where, where you, these, the, this is where you have cracks is where you have the most intense uh, air ocean inter interchange uh, exchange because uh, uh, when the ice is close together, you only have 10 cents of watts per meter squared of, of heat flux into the atmosphere. But when it opens up, uh, oceans opened up to the, the winter atmosphere, you get hundreds of watts per meter squared uh, into the atmosphere. So, so even though you, you had only a few percent of cracks in the Arctic Ocean, it would be significant compared to the contribution compared to the, where the thick ice is located. So, and, and so the other thing that's important is uh, redistribution, which I've uh, mentioned earlier. So if you look at the middle plot, it's sort of a, a distribution of ice thickness in the Arctic Ocean. And the reason why you have distribution, so if you look at the mode, typically, is where you have uh, thermodynamic growth. Uh, basically, if you don't have any dynamics, you grow a certain amount of ice. And there's typically a limit that you can, on how much you can grow based on climate, uh, just thermodynamically. Uh, it's probably around two meters. Uh, so, so the the the, distribu the thicker ice is where you are is is because of deformation and it's because where you have uh, ice flows that are moving uh, against each other and, or being compressed against the coast. And so, so the ice thickness distribution is one of the things that's that's reasonably I think it's 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 still to be. Uh, a lot of models represent it reasonably well, but I think there's still a lot of issues in terms of getting the right number of, right percentage of, of open, open water in the Arctic Ocean because the ice models right now are still uh, operating as a, in a viscous plastic uh, model, uh, whereas the ice is 
really solid, uh, and and you don't typically get the the cracks that you you see in in real life com when you compare uh, the, the the modeled ice deformation with the the observed ice distribution. So 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 and and, and obviously when you have ridging and and deformation, you can get store a little more ice per unit area uh, for for a given uh, in in the in the Arctic Ocean. So that's that's sort of that, and I think I'll, my conclusion. So there, there. This, so these are some very large scale and gross description description of the Arctic, and there are a lot of small scale processes that are important that that are not covered here, uh, and and those are uh, representing those Im are important if we want to um, do a better job at forecast. Uh, uh, in terms of getting figuring out where the ice, wh whether we can predict where the ice is going to be in during the melt season, uh, and and so obviously these states has broad interest in that. And the other comment I have is that uh, there there's lots of gaps in understanding and observations. Uh, you know what you saw is sort of a gross description of what's changing, uh, but there uh, it's it's. It's still a significant challenge in trying to do attribution as to what's actually causing the ice loss, and that's uh, and that's a challenge. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ron, for an interesting talk. So we'll just have a few short questions <clears throat> now, saving any longer questions for the discussion period after all the talks. Any short questions? I can't go eat my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> How accurately can, uh, can we know ice thickness from the observations? Uh, excuse me. Uh, How accurately? How accurately? Uh, I think it's, it's, dependent on, it's dependent on season. So the best we've been able to assess how well we can do it is by comparing with uh, moorings. Uh, I put sonar, uh, so we have a put sonar, so we can compare ice drifting over it and compare it satellite. And what we've been able to do, probably say safely, it's about half a meter. And and part of that is because it's very difficult to compare satellites with point observations, as you know. Uh, and so there's some variability associated with that comparison. And, and also, the, uh, uh, there's, there's uh, one thing that we don't know very much about the Arctic, or accurately about the Arctic, is snow, snow coverage, and how thick that snow is. Because the snow is, uh, it exerts a significant influence on ice growth and heat flux. And so that's one thing that we need uh, for actually doing accurate thickness retrieval. So one quick question. Uh, yes, very quick. Um, this may be a dumb question, but the um, the thickness does that include the uh, the total thickness or just the part that's above the surface? And let me give, let me ask a second question. How do you measure the area of ice that's passing through Fram Strait? How do you do that? Okay. So the first question was the thickness is act. What we estimate is the actual thickness from the top of the ice, snow ice interface to the bottom to the ice water interface. That's an estimate. Uh, what we measure from satellite is, at least the ones that we use for doing ice thickness, is the freeboard, which is the bit between the surface of the ocean and top of the ice, but up the parts floating. The, the half meter is the whole thing. Yeah, the half meter uncertainty is the whole thing. And the area through Fram Strait is just basically using ice motion and ice thickness. It's just a flux. We have ice motion, and we know how thick the ice is flowing through the ice <coughs> Fram Strait, and that you just multiply the two, the perpendicular. Basically, it's a dot product of the uh, gate uh, versus the ice motion, and multiplied by the volume. Okay, so we need to move on. 
started. I'm just kind of seeing the area of the microphone. Okay. okay. So our next speaker is Julianne Strove, who's going to talk about an Arctic Ocean in transition. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to follow on a little bit of what Ron was talking about um, and expand a little bit more on what's happening right now with the Arctic sea ice, in part because I think it helps us better understand, you know, how well we can do seasonal ice forecasting and sort of what the future evolution of the sea ice cover is going to be. So, oops. Okay. Is it going to work? Okay, I'll use the keyboard. So as Ron mentioned, the Arctic Ocean has been seeing less and less summer sea ice um, over the last several decades of the satellite observations. I think what's interesting, so if we look at the long-term trend in September sea ice extent, it's decreasing right now at about 87,000 square kilometers per year, or a rate of about 14% per decade. But there's a clear breakpoint in the trends if we do breakpoint analysis. So around the mid-1990s, we see this change where we have an earlier time period, say 1979 to 1996, where we're losing ice at about 30,000 square kilometers per year. But if you look at the latter part of the record, the ice loss has really accelerated at a rate of about 130,000 square kilometers per year. And in fact, the 10 lowest sea ice extents that we've seen in September have all occurred within the last 10 years. And this year shaping up to be another near record low, if not a new record low again for this year. So we're seeing an accelerated pace right now of sea ice loss in the Arctic. But I think what's interesting, even though we focus a lot on the summer and that's what gets the most attention because that's a time period where we have the largest trends, actually if we start looking at things a bit closer, we see that there's been a real shift in the last few years. So if I look at the standardized sea ice extent anomalies now for every month, so blue is showing positive, red is showing negative, and the bold colors are times when the sea ice extent is more than two standard deviations below the long-term mean. And you would sometimes see you might have a, a year where September sea ice extent maybe fell more than two standard de deviations below the long-term mean. But in the last several years, and in fact the last 16 months have been consecutive um, months where you've had more than two standard deviations below the long-term mean. So these changes that we're seeing right now in summer, they're also extending to the other months as well. And so we're seeing this really big transition right now within the Arctic Ocean, not just in summer, but also in the wintertime, also in the shoulder seasons as well. I think it's also useful to keep um, these satellite observations, which are still relatively short with four decades, into a longer term perspective. And so NSIDC released a new updated historical data set, um, I think it was last year or the year before, but Walsh et al. Um, processed all the data where they're looking at um, basically mid-month extents um, brought back all the way to 1850 using a variety of observations, so using the satellite observations, using ship and aircraft observations, whaling records ice chart data, and so we can go back until about now 1850, and then we can look at what's, what's happening today in a longer term context. And there certainly were times in the past, so say in the 1940s where you had less sea ice related to the time when the Arctic was a bit warmer, but what we're seeing today is really unprecedented in at least the last 150 years within the Arctic. Another way to sort of look at what's happening in the Arctic is we could compute, say, for example, a seasonality index. So if I look at that from the 1850 data record onwards, we can see this real shift in seasonality happening within the Arctic, so the difference between the maximum and the minimum divided by the annual extent. And what appears to be happening is it was pretty stable for, for many decades, and all of a sudden in the last couple decades you're really seeing a spike increase in seasonality. And it's starting to look a little bit more like the Antarctic. So this idea that the Arctic Ocean is now starting to become more like the Antarctic seems to be a real possibility for us. Another way to look at how the Arctic is changing is to look at regional monthly trends. So um, Ingrid Ornheim, who's one of our co-authors on this, um, this talk and as well as a um, variations article we wrote, she's got a paper right now um, under review where we're just looking at changes in the seasonality of the sea ice trends. So we're looking at trends here as a function of month on the x-axis and the regions in the Arctic on the y-axis. And what we have, we kind of define what we call oops, I don't think my laser pointer works, um, a summer mode and a winter mode. So most of the ice loss that's happening right now within the central Arctic is all happening during the summertime. So regions like the Beaufort, the Chukchi, the East Siberian, Laptev Seas, those all have very large trends. And the largest trends are in September, a little bit also earlier in the, in the melt season, but not so many trends in, in October, November. The ice quickly refreezes again in winter, 
and you have really no changes happening um, in the wintertime or in the shoulder seasons. But other regions, such as the Barents Sea, the Greenland Sea, all the seasonal ice zones, they're what we refer to as a winter mode. So these regions mostly lose all of their sea ice in summer. So the trends that we're seeing right now in those regions are really in wintertime. Delays in autumn freeze up and earlier melting when springtime begins. And it kind of gives you an idea of maybe how the Arctic Ocean is going to transition. So the Barents Sea, for example, is already becoming a seasonally ice-free region where it has very small trends in summer. There's very little ice left in the summertime. So it's to moved in sort of what we call this winter mode. The Kara Sea is sort of a next sea that's likely to be transitioning towards um, a winter mode where it's going to be losing a lot of its summer sea ice and the trend is starting to extend further out. So it's just another way to look at how the Arctic Ocean is changing right now. Another thing that's quite interesting, and I've seen this um, in other talks, but that there seems to be this increase in variability that's been happening, specifically since about 2007. And if this is indeed the case, and we have this massive increase in variability from year to year, that really makes seasonal ice forecasting difficult because we cannot predict these weather events that result in large fluctuations of the sea ice cover. And it also is sort of what we can look at as sort of an early indicator towards a new Arctic state if there is this indeed large increase in variability happening over time. But I would caution about that because we started looking at this closer and we started looking at it with the longer term data set, so the 1850 to 2013 data set, and we found that the trend, and because the seasonality is changing over time, that really strongly determines whether or not there's been an increase in variance because your baseline that you compare with is changing over time. So if you use a 1981 to 2010 baseline, your interpretation of your increase in variance is going to be very different than if you use like a running mean baseline that actually captures the change in seasonality and the trend. And so when we do that analysis and we remove, um, we do a running mean baseline, so the blue um, line in the bottom plot, you can see that that big spike in the increase in variance actually starts to go away. And we actually have larger increases in variance, say, in the 1950s, for example. So I want to just focus a little bit on what happened after the 2016 minimum. So in 2016, we didn't reach a new record low, um, but we did have record lows every month afterwards as we went through the winter season and also through the fall. And one of the things that we saw, and we've been seeing this happening more, is that the freeze-up is being delayed quite a bit. And if we look Arctic-wide, freeze-up was delayed for about 20 days um, compared to the long-term mean. But specifically, the freeze-up was very much delayed in the Beaufort and Machukchi and the East Siberian Seas by about three to four weeks. And it was also delayed in the Barents Sea by nearly two months. And so this is a pattern we've been seeing happening um, in the last several years. So, my question was, how does this impact, for example, the winter sea ice? And are we starting to see these big changes that are happening now in the fall and winter as a result of these changes, say, in the freeze-up? At the same time, there's been a new study that Graham et al. published this year that was suggesting that winters in the Arctic are becoming warmer and that warming events are lasting longer. So last winter was the warmest winter recorded thus far in the Arctic. Um, the 2015-2016 winter was quite warm with temperature anomalies about 5 degrees um, Celsius above average um, in certain parts of the Arctic. The North Pole reached temperatures above zero. And this last year we saw the same thing happening. So we've been having these moist and warm air intrusions into the Arctic during winter. Graham et al. suggests that these are becoming more frequent. So the question is, is how is that impacting the sea ice cover? And one of the things we looked at is whether or not so if we just look at freezing degree day anomalies, so the number of days when the air temperatures are cold enough for the sea ice to form, and we look at 2016 to 2017, you can see that this year was quite anomalous compared to um, average if you look at the long-term mean, which is sort of a dark gray shading, but also compared to all previous years and even compared to the winter 2015 to 2016. So we had a very warm winter in the Arctic. If we look at where that pattern happens, so where you had these anomalous freezing degree days, and we can compare it to the winter before. In 2015, it was really focused on the Barents and the Kara Sea sector, so you had much less um, freezing degree days in that region, and there's been a few studies that have looked at how that impacted ice growth, or at least ice extent within that region. This last winter, those freezing degree day anomalies were more widespread, so they still had sort of this increase um, or decrease in freezing degree days within the Kara and the Barents Seas,
but this time it stretched across the Arctic Ocean, to, uh, across the pole, and then over up and towards the Chukchi Sea. So if this is becoming a um, more frequent event, so that we're going to start having these sorts of conditions, it's really important then to understand how this affects our sea ice cover and how it affects ice growth through the winter. So we wanted to look at um, how it's impacted ice growth. Um, one of the things we do know is we did have a lowest record maximum again in 2017, which followed the record maximum, lowest maximum in 2016, which occurred after the 2015 one. So we're having these consecutive winters where we're seeing the least amount of winter ice. And the question is, is whether or not this is a result of these warm winters that are starting to impact thermodynamic ice growth, or is it more of a dynamically driven event, which is something that Ron Kwok was talking about. So if you have changes in circulation patterns, that are causing um, compaction of the ice or more ice export that could also be um, playing a role in terms of how much winter ice there is left over. I would say one of the problems that we have with this is that ice thickness observations, I don't think, are quite robust enough in order for us to address these kinds of questions. And part of it is, as Ron mentioned, that to do reliable sea ice thickness from our current satellite system, so um, radar altimetry, for example, from Cryosat, requires us to know how much snow is on the ice. And all the data products that are out there right now assume a snow climatology. And so, but we know that snow can be very variable from year to year. It also can be very dependent on individual storms. And so assuming a climatology for snow depth makes it really difficult, I think, for us to look at how individual years differ from each other or even how ice growth changes over the season. So one of our solutions to do this was to look at um, observations, so you're looking at cryostat thickness retrievals, but also looking at climate model, I mean not climate model runs, but you're looking at the size sea ice model runs to evaluate how these warm winters may be impacting ice growth and also looking at dynamical contributions. And that's certainly an advantage from using a model is that we can actually diagnose how much of the thickness changes are due to changes in ice growth or changes in dynamicals thickening. So. I just thought I'd show what the thickness anomaly was this last November. So I'm showing two different satellite data products. One is coming from CPOM at UCL, which is on the left-hand side, and the other one is coming from the Alfred Wegener Institute. And they have slightly different processing, but um, they pretty much show sort of the same signature and the fact that we had thicker ice generally north of Canada and Greenland and thinner ice sort of in the central Arctic. And so this is our situation as we went into the, um, the winter. So now if we move forward and we go to April, um, we can compare excuse me, the um, cryosat thickness anomaly for April 2017, which is in the upper left-hand corner, compared to that from running the size sea ice model. And you'll notice that there are some consistencies in terms of that there is thicker ice sort of across the pole and near the going towards Siberia. But you do see some um, deviations from that in terms of we see still that like, we kept that thickest, thickness anomaly that we saw in November in the size model runs. We don't see that in the cryosat data. So this could be an artifact of snow loading that may be biasing the cryosat thickness retrievals in that region because it wouldn't make a sense that you'd probably lose that really large positive thickness anomaly. But if you just average Arctic wide, both the satellite data as well as using the size model, give us that overall this April the sea ice was about 13 to 15 centimeters thinner than it was compared to the 2010 to 2017 mean, which is the cryosat data record. So we did have thinner ice this year, than we think, than what we've had the last several winters. But then we can go further and we can diagnose how much of that thickness anomaly was due to reduced thermodynamic ice growth or how much of it might have been due to changes in ice motion and ice advection. So if we just look at the lower um, left-hand plot that's looking at the thermodynamic contributions to ice growth, and we can see that mostly Arctic-wide ice growth was reduced throughout the Arctic, especially in regions where you have thicker ice, where you're not actually growing um, as much ice because the ice is too thick. But you also see regions where you had more vigorous ice growth. So, for example, off the coast of Barrow, we had quite vigorous ice growth, and also in some of the coastal locations. And this makes sense because for thinner ice, you tend to have more ice growth than you would over thicker ice, so you should see these positive anomalies. If we look at the dynamical contributions, we see that overall there was a slight thickening of these sea ice if we just looked at dynamical contributions. And what happened this last winter is we had a positive Arctic oscillation from December through March, and so that led to increased offshore ice advection from Siberia, enhanced the transpolar drift stream, as Ron mentioned, 
And it caused a lot of ridging and rafting of the ice sort of north of Svalbard and in the Barents and the Kara Sea. So we had much thicker ice in that region. And actually, if we were to look at today's sea ice, this is where the ice is not really retreating this summer. In fact, the ice is hanging on in that region. And the ice edge is right right now at average levels for that part of the Arctic. And I think it is in large part to the fact that we had a lot of um, dynamical thickening over winter within that region. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the other thing, though, that I think that's interesting is that, in general, we, we think that negative feedbacks dominate in winter. So if you, if you lose a lot of sea ice, you have a lot of um, open water area that, that has rapid ice formation. You also have more rapid ice formation in thin ice regions. And this is something that climate models have also shown. So we do have sort of this negative feedback that can help stabilize um, ice loss. And if you just look at the top plot, that shows the winter, so November to April, ice growth over time from 1985 through 2017. This, again, is, is a model estimate. But you can see that there's a general trend towards increased ice growth, thermodynamic ice growth over time. If you look at the spatial plot that's next to it, it shows you the regions where you have more vigorous ice growth, which is the regions where you've been losing the ice. So you have a lot more thermodynamic ice growth in those regions. The next plot down is actually just the air temperatures from November to April. Those are also increasing. And so you can see that even though winters are getting warmer, you actually have more ice growth happening over winter. So that might be a bit counterintuitive. There's very little correlation between increasing winter air temperatures and um, decrease in ice growth. But what is interesting is that since you can see the peaks in the ice growth in 2007 and 2012, so the times when we had the record minimum sea ice extent, but then following 2012, we seem to have a drop right now in ice growth. And then we've had increased spiking in um, air temperatures and less freezing degree days. So perhaps, at least if you look on the second plot down in the spatial plot, we do see a stronger correlation happening between ice growth and freezing degree day anomalies or air temperatures um, within sort of the Chukchi Sea and also along the Kara and the Barents Sea sector. So it might be changing over time. <coughs> so I just wanted to touch on quickly our understanding about what's driving sea ice loss. Now, climate models, both from CMIP 3 and CMIP 5, have at least been in qualitative agreement with the observations that sea ice has been declining over the observational data record. So that's good news since each climate model could be in their own phase of natural climate variability. It could be showing increases or decreases, but they all show a decrease. But the pace of the ice loss has been underestimated by these climate models. Um, most of these models do not capture the rate of ice loss very well. Um, but they do show that at least if, you, if we, we trust the multi-model ensemble mean representing sort of that force component, that about 50 to 60 percent of the ice loss is a result of anthropogenic warming, and the rest of it is due to natural climate variability. What's interesting, what we decided to look at this last year was just like, OK, so we know that sea ice has been declining. It's very strongly related to global warming. So we looked at the change in sea ice as a function of cumulative CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. And if we do that, we get a very strong linear trend, about three square meters per um, ton of CO2. And we thought, OK, well, how does this then look in the climate models as well? And when we look at that, we find that the observed sensitivity, which is about three square meters um, per ton of CO2, is actually much larger than what we see in the climate models. So all of the models underestimate um, the observed sensitivity, except for MIROC ESM is the only one that actually shows a bit larger sensitivity. But most of these are underestimating the observed sensitivity. Um, and the multi-model ensemble mean is about 1.75. So I think what's interesting about this type of analysis is it does give us another way to sort of look at what the future evolution of the sea ice cover would be. Because if, indeed, just as the models and observations show that there's a strong linear relationship between sea ice and anthropogenic CO2, then we could use today's estimates of how much CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere as a means for um, estimating when the Arctic Ocean will become ice free. The linear relationship holds in all months, so it's not just in summer that we see this linear relationship. But with another 700 gigatons of carbon, this, we'll be losing the September sea ice, which will happen probably in about 20 years at the current emission rates, about 35 to 40 gigatons of carbon per year. But this just gives you an idea of how it will evolve um, for the other months as well. So of course, September will be the first month to go ice free, but the other months are following quite closely. And I'm running out of time, so I will quit here. Thanks.
Is this on? Okay, so we, uh, we have time for a few quick questions. <laughs> Wait for the mic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, the uncertainty associated with the observations. In the previous speaker's talk, it was indicated that there was probably half a meter mm -hmm. uncertainty in the ice thickness. And then in some of the plots that you showed, observations were just like a line without any uncertainty estimates associated with that. And some of the trends that you showed uh, over a certain period, there was less than 50 centimeter trend uh, over a given year. So that's in the uncertainty. I guess I'm not sure whether the uncertainty amount is stationary or not in well, time. So, so most of what I was showing is based on the passive microwave satellite data record, which is measuring the sea ice extent. And definitely different algorithms will give you slightly different results. So in terms of the absolute magnitude of the total amount of the Arctic Ocean covered by sea ice, that does differ depending on which sea ice algorithm you use. But I would say that um, the overall trends are pretty much the same between the different um, algorithms that are applied. So I think it's more important to be consistent with the algorithm that you apply and make sure that your, your record's very well intercalibrated, which this record is. Now, in terms of sea ice thickness, there's a lot more uncertainty with that, which is one of the reasons why when we were looking at sort of how this warm winter may have impacted ice growth, we were afraid to just rely on the observational data record because there is large uncertainty. And so that's why we employed a model in that to just sort of look at what would have been the impact of this warm winter, initializing with sort of the November ice thickness and see what happened. Any more quick questions? One more over that. <clears throat> is anyone looking at the if, whether or not there are feedbacks um, from the, um, the signal from the, the loss of ice to the atmosphere as opposed to the other way around? Yeah, no, there has there have been many studies looking at that. And so one of the things that we noticed in the Arctic is that the Arctic atmosphere is definitely becoming more moist, more humid. Um, cloud cover has been increasing, and part of this is the feedback from the loss of sea ice. So you definitely have a larger exchange of uh, heat fluxes. So it's also one of the factors towards Arctic amplification, so a larger warming that we see in the Arctic compared to the rest of the planet. But we also are seeing moist air intrusions into the Arctic as well. So part of the um, increase in water vapor, for example, in the Arctic, some of it's due to sea ice loss, but some of it's also due to changes in circulation that are bringing this moist air into the Arctic. I don't think anybody's really quantified yet, though, how much of the increase in tropospheric water vapor, for example, is a result of sea ice loss versus um, moist air intrusions. Okay, so I think we need to move on. We'll have more qu time for questions at the end. So our next speaker is um, Alec Petty. That should work. That should work. No, check it. Sorry. Oh, yeah. it yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and Alec will be talking about improving our understanding of our Antarctic sea ice with NASA's Operation Ice Bridge in the upcoming ISAT-2 mission. Yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. Um, and for inviting me to, the, um, to submit an article for the Clivar Variation. Um, so I think I was tasked by Jamie with talking about Antarctic sea ice, um, and specifically kind of the, the role of Antarctic sea ice and the importance of Antarctic sea ice um, for the Southern Ocean and potentially the global um, ocean circulation. Um, so that's hopefully what I'm going to talk about today, um, try and maybe convince you of this fact. Um, and I'm mainly going to talk about observations collected by several NASA missions, so I'll talk about some, some observations we have of sea ice from NASA's ISAT-1, the, the satellite um, product that uh, Ron was mentioning in his talk, um, but also look to this airborne campaign, Operation Ice Bridge, which is currently underway, um, and look ahead to the ISAT-2 mission, which hopefully will launch next summer. Um, and interestingly, I was talking to Torsten Marcus, who's um, the lab chief um, of the Cryotech Sciences branch at NASA Goddard, and said that I was tasked with this, this kind of talk to convince maybe the audience, the importance of Antarctic sea ice. And he said he actually gave a similar talk several years ago. He was invited by Arnold Gordon um, at a previous um, U.S. Clybar summit. So clearly we haven't fully convinced the oceanogra oceanography community of the importance of Antarctic sea ice. So hopefully I'll get a bit closer today. Um, so, yeah, just to reorientate ourselves. So we're talking about Antarctic sea ice now, so we're, we're switching poles. Um, and so the kind of interesting difference between Arctic and Antarctic sea ice is, is the, the fact it's an opposite geometry. So while the Arctic is a, is a deep ocean basin surrounded by land, the Antarctic sea ice cover surrounds um, the continental landmass of Antarctica. So it's a more unconstrained sea ice cover 
And due to those offshore winds from the Katabatics over Antarctica, it's a more divergent sea ice regime. Um, so we expect the sea ice to be behaving differently in the Antarctic compared to the Arctic. Um, so this is a map of the sea ice concentration, um, which you can see in the slightly, slightly different white um, from the AMSA 2 passive microwave sensor that's also been discussed already. And so as well as being this polar opposite in terms of geometry, we've seen these um, opposite trends in the Antarctic sea ice cover compared to the in, um, strong trends in Arctic sea ice that Julien was discussing. Um, so this is a figure taken from a, a paper that came out in Nature um, just about a month ago from Joey Camiso at NASA and John Turner at Bass. Um, and so... Yeah, what we're showing here is the Antarctic sea ice cover in red and the um, Arctic sea ice cover, um, this is sea ice extent, in blue. And these are the um, anomalies relative to the mean. So again, Julian highlighted this strong decline in the Arctic sea ice. Specifically, the really rapid declines in the summer Arctic sea ice. So these are the records set in 2007 and 2012. Um, but in contrast, we've had this long-term increase in the Antarctic sea ice extent. Note that the absolute value of Antarctic sea ice extent tends to be higher, so the actual percentage increase is only a few percent compared to the kind of 10 or so percent decline we've seen in the Arctic sea ice cover, especially in the summer. Um, but this paper was really focused on what we've seen in the last year. So while um, there's been this long-term trend, starting from around this time last year, we saw the dramatic decline in the Antarctic sea ice cover, um, which is why they, they wrote this article saying we need to solve Antarctica's sea ice puzzle. Um, because people were extremely surprised by this. Um, Antarctic sea ice scientists have been really focused on trying to explain to the community why it is we've had this long-term increase. Um, and now we have to kind of flip mode and explain why it is we've observed this really sharp decrease. So it's a bit of a challenge. Um, and just to show this record, the kind of the Antarctic sea ice in more detail, this is again the AMSA 2 sea ice concentration data um, starting from August of last year, extending up to, to March of this year. So this is daily data. And so we see this dramatic um, retreat of the sea ice pack, um, with many regions around Antarctica becoming completely ice-free. Again, this does happen in other years, but it was the fact that it happened um, kind of circum Antarctica, especially in the east, eastern, Arctic, uh, eastern Antarctic. Um, and these regions like the Weddell Sea, which um, experienced some of the strongest retreats compared to, compared to climatology. Um, and so, again, this is an animation produced by NASA that was also included in that Nature paper. So, yeah, this is an interesting surprise, um, and it's definitely um, motivating for trying to understand the variability of the Antarctic sea ice cover. But I want to also take a bit of a step back and discuss why we should be caring about Antarctic sea ice at all. And luckily, there have been a couple of papers that have come out recently that I think have really um, provided really useful insight into this topic. So the first is a paper by Ryan Abernathy and others that came out in Nature Geosciences last year. Um, and so what they were doing was trying to demonstrate the importance of sea ice um, for the Southern Ocean circulation. So what they did was use um, data from the Southern Ocean State Estimate Model, which is this model fit to available observations, um, to try and look at the freshwater fluxes entering the Southern Ocean. So we have a schematic of the Southern Ocean circulation here. We've got the kind of upper branch here and the lower branch here, this kind of bottom water forming um, branch, um, which we kind of know that sea ice is very important in driving, which I'll touch on in a couple of slides' time. But maybe the upper branch was a bit more uncertain. Um, but what they did is they looked at the freshwater fluxes from the atmosphere and land, which is shown on the bottom left here. So this freshwater comes from precipitation and evaporation in these regions over the Southern Ocean and also from glacial meltwater um, from these coastal regions as these ice shelves melt. But they also then looked at a freshwater flux that was actually entering the ocean, which is shown at the map on the um, bottom right here. And in the absence of sea ice, these two things should be equal. But because we have sea ice, we have another source of freshwater redistribution. Um, so sea ice um, in the middle here is, is the difference between these two maps. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing a, a a negative freshwater flux in these shelf sea regions, which is due to sea ice formation. So sea ice, as it forms, it essentially sucks up freshwater and dumps brine into the ocean. Um, but then as that sea ice is transported northwards, as I said, that sea ice regime is a more divergent 
regime driven by um, off-coast winds. We get a northward transport of sea ice and a melt of sea ice, which dumps fresh water into the ocean. And they show that this dumping of um, fresh water into the ocean from sea ice melt potentially dominates over precipitation and evaporation, helping drive the transformation of the upper branch. So sea ice is important. Um, another paper that came out at virtually the same time in Nature um, touched on the same issue, um, but went kind of one step further. So they used observations and models to look at um, the drivers of sea ice freshwater transport. Um, so the middle map here kind of follows on from that previous slide, and this is the freshwater transport from sea ice. Um, and so we can see these positive transports um, in the Weddell Sea region and the Ross Sea region. Um, but they, as I said, went a step further, but also looking at trends. So they looked at the trends in the sea ice drift and thickness to try and calculate trends in the freshwater transport from sea ice, which is shown on the map on the right here. So the reds now indicate a decline in freshwater transport, and the blue indicates an increase in freshwater transport. Um, and so they're finding significant trends, um, which they concluded is significantly altering the salinity distribution of the Southern Ocean, which affects both the upper and lower branches of the overturning circulation. Then I kind of looked at a bit of this issue during my PhD. Um, so what I wanted to do is look at the importance of sea ice for shelf water formation, the kind of initial trigger to the lower branch of that overturning circulation. And so these are some results of the sea ice thickness growth from the sea ice model size around Antarctica. Um, and so this combined with some more idealized studies um, we carried out showed that we potentially have this kind of bimodal pattern of sea ice growth around Antarctica. Um, what we think we see is we, we have these strong, and again, other, other work has also demonstrated this too, that we have in, in the Weddell and Ross Seas, this, this rapid, these rapid sea ice factories that produce several meters of sea ice each year. And what that means is we get these um, high salinity shelf waters forming as a lot of brine is rejected, and it's this high salinity shelf water that cascades off the shelf and forms bottom water. Um, but in the Amundsen and Bellingshausen seas, for example, and other regions around Antarctica, we don't get several meters of sea ice being formed. We only get maybe one or two, and that isn't enough to cause shelf waters to form. And so instead, we have these shallower mixed layers, and we have warm waters flooding onto the shelf. And it's these warm waters that are implicated in the basal melting and thinning of ice shelves fringing the West Antarctic ice sheet. So what's important here for understanding the impact of sea ice on the Southern Ocean is clearly its thickness. If we combine thickness with concentration, we get volume, and also its circulation, so how that sea ice is being moved around. And so just going back to that nature study I highlighted, um, I want to just kind of show you what, what they're using to try and understand sea ice thickness. So it gives you a kind of idea of what the communities um, currently have available, um, the, the tools that the, cur the community currently has available. Um, so what they did is they used actually sea ice thickness from a model. Um, this is a model reconstruction by François Mazinet. Um, again, it's a model constrained by some observations. They then looked at some ob observations from ships at the bottom here. So this is the Aspect Project, which has collected ship-based observations of sea ice thickness. Again, visual observations, so pretty uncertain. Um, but also the ISAT-derived thickness estimates. So Ron talked about the ISAT thickness products in the Arctic. We, Nathan Kurtz and NASA, uh, and NASA Goddard has also produced thickness estimates for the Antarctic sea ice pack. And so they could bias correct using this as kind of the truth and produce this kind of reconstructed trend of sea ice thickness. So they're showing thicknesses around one and a half meters or so um, in the Weddell Sea, but thickness is a lot lower, um, especially in the eastern Antarctic sea ice pack, which is kind of confirmed to some degree by the observations. And they're seeing trends on the order of maybe 10 centimeters or so a decade, so pretty small. Um, but unfortunately, um, those ISAT thickness estimates are still very much a, a kind of research product. So as has already been discussed, luckily, they're by no means the absolute truth here. There are, there are uncertainties um, in deriving these thickness products, mainly deriving from the fact we're not measuring sea ice thickness. We're measuring, as Ron said, we're measuring the freeboard, the extension of that sea ice above the sea level, and we're deriving thickness by making some assumption about the snow cover over sea ice. That's really our primary source of uncertainty. And this is, this is an issue, maybe even more so, for the Antarctic data. Um, and so 
what Nathan did recently to try and look at this in a bit more detail is compare with some other observations we have in the Antarctic. Um, so the stars here show locations of, of, of upward-looking sonar moorings that were deployed in the Weddell Sea. And so what he did was simply correlate the two. So where we have crossovers in space and time of the moorings with the satellite. As Ron said, the, the, kind of, the benefit of the moorings is they look up at the draft, which is a lot bigger than the freeboard, so the accuracies are a lot higher. So we see that as more of a truth than the satellite product. And we see that the, um, the correlations are actually really low, which was kind of <laughs> unfortunate. <laughs> Um, the R value about 0.3. But if you look at the scatter, you can see that a lot of these points are lying on the line. And our low correlation is driven by some of these regions where the moorings are finding ice that's a lot thicker than the satellite product. So the moorings are showing thicknesses of like two and a half meters, whereas the satellite is showing thicknesses of like a meter. So we're showing big differences here. So we can kind of cheat here and just exclude those. Uh, <laughs> and if we just focus on the thin ice regimes, we can say, well, the satellite's doing pretty well. Right. So I think the conclusion here is that we're not doing so well maybe in that thicker deformed ice around Antarctica, and we need to do better there. Um, one of the ways we could do better is thinking a bit more about the snow depth assumptions we're using to derive this thickness. Um, so again, this is the idea of um, freeboard and thickness that's been discussed before. We're measuring the top of the snow with the laser, and we're measuring the sea level with the laser, and then we have to decide how much snow we have. So what Nathan does, based on some in situ campaigns that have been operating in the Antarctic over the last decade or so, they, they suggested that actually maybe this snow ice interface was around sea level, that maybe all of the freeboard was snow and all of the draft was ice. So that's the assumption that he makes in his product, um, because unfortunately we don't really have much else. We don't have many snow observations. So this is what happens when you have a freeboard of around um, this, the freeboard's around half a meter or so in some places, and you have a thickness that can be up to around one and a half meters. But one of the only products we do have is we have passive microwave-derived snow depths. So this is a data product that's produced by Torsten, uh, Marcus, uh, um, and others, and NASA. Um, again, there are uncertainties associated with this product. It's using that brightness temperature um, data that we use to derive CS concentration. Um, but it's one of our best guesses for a kind of pan-Antarctic or pan-Arctic um, snow depth. But it only really works over the first year sea ice. It doesn't work so well over the, the multi-year ice. Um, but if we now look at what that shows, we can see this is the passive microwave-derived snow depth for the same time period. And we see this is a lot lower than the freeboards. So that kind of suggests that maybe, maybe we do have a significant part of that freeboard that's actually sea ice. So when we use this updated product to derive thickness, we get thicknesses that are a lot higher. And again, I think this really touches on the, the questions that have been asked already of how uncertain these products are, and I think the conclusion is pretty uncertain, especially in the Antarctic. Um, but maybe, maybe if, you're, if you're concerned more with the thinner ice regimes, they're doing pretty well, but in some regions they're not. So this is definitely something we need to think about more in the community. And one of the ways we're doing that is by using data from NASA's Operation Icebridge. This is, uh, this is an airborne campaign that's been operating since 2009 to bridge the gap between the ISAT-1 satellite and the upcoming launch of ISAT-2. So this is a nice visualization of IceBridge in action. Um, so the main sensors on IceBridge are a conically scanning laser altimeter, um, but also um, it has a snow radar on board. And so it's this combination of sensors that give us um, a better chance at capturing um, more accurate information about the sea ice state. Um, and so, yeah, I think I mentioned that this, this is for both poles. So people have looked a lot at ice bridge data in the Arctic, but maybe, maybe less so in the Antarctic. Um, one of the only people that have looked at some of this Antarctic sea ice data is Ron, uh, who published a paper a couple of years ago looking at some of the earlier years of data from ice bridge. So using that snow radar, so the snow radar penetrates through the snow and gives us information of where the snow layer is and where the snow ice interface is. You can drive some um, estimates of snow depth. And so he showed that the snow depth, just in that Weddell Sea region, but he also looked at the Bellingshausen Sea region, was highly variable, but in general, less than the freeboards. Um, but unfortunately, this is, this is extremely challenging. I'm sure Ron will attest to this. Um, we have these complicated snow ice interfaces where we have a lot of flooding of seawater, especially in the Antarctic sea ice pack. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainties associated with this kind of work. So another thing we're doing is trying to just use the raw 
um, laser ATM data from IceBridge to, to try and characterize just what the surface morphology of the Antarctic sea ice pack is. So that's another thing that we don't really know much about with Antarctic sea ice. We don't really know its thickness particularly well, and we also don't know really what it looks like from the surface, how much rough ice is there, how much smooth ice is there. Um, so this is something that's kind of work in progress. This is a map of, in the background is the um, backscatter data, which kind of gives you some kind of proxy for roughness. And this is the, the data of kind of, you can think of this as roughness from the laser data. So we see regions that are maybe very thick along the coastline of, of the Weddell Sea, but maybe much thinner, uh, much smoother ice regimes in, say, the Ross Sea. And why this matters is it matters for snow. Rougher ice is much better at accumulating snow than smooth ice. Um, it also matters for, for drag, so that how much the winds can push the sea ice around. If we have rougher ice, then the winds can push that ice around more so than smoother ice, potentially. Um, so again, I'm showing a lot of kind of work in progress, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll have some more information about the wind drag over Antarctic sea ice soon. And then the other thing we're hoping to do is um, get ready for the, the launch of ISAT 2. So again, this is scheduled for launch in 2018. Um, and so it's a bit different to the ISAT satellite. Um, ISAT was a single beam profiling laser altimeter. ISAT-2, in contrast, is a photon counting laser altimeter which has six beams, shown by this figure here. So this is kind of my schematic of ice bridge profiling the sea ice surface and ISAT-2 profiling as well. So we have these three pairs of beams separated by a few kilometers each, each with a footprint of around 15 meters. Um, yeah, I think that's a good summarized here. So again, the, the, the idea is that from ISAT-2, we're going to get these hopefully routine measurements of sea ice freeboard. Ron's going to be one of the people doing that. Um, but again, we're going to have to think about snow depth. It's kind of the elephant in the room with all of this. Um, you know, if you want to calculate thickness of ice that too, that's still going to be probably our primary source of uncertainty. Um, but the one thing we do have um, is this really high um, along track sampling. So one of the other exciting things we can do with ice that too is, similar to ice bridge, look at the kind of roughness of um, the sea ice surface and how that varies in space and time. Um, and then kind of the final slide I've got is um, some of the work we're hoping to do in terms of improving sea ice models. So I'm a kind of, uh, you know, my PhD was more on sea ice modeling. I've got more into the remote sensing, but I'm trying to kind of bridge the two. Um, so this is work that I've um, been involved with, Mich with Michelle Samados at UCL. Um, so he published a paper a couple of years ago showing that we can now introduce these new physics into sea ice models. Um, physics regarding how much rigid ice we're getting, how much deformed ice we're getting, and the impact that might have on the drag coefficient. Um, and again, this is important for determining how the sea ice is moving around the Arctic. Um, and we've also incorporated this into the sea ice model and run simulations for the Antarctic. So at first, you can just see these kind of obvious differences in, in, the, in, the, um, in the relative deformations of the two um, sea ice packs. We see a lot less deformation in the, in the Antarctic, as expected. It's a much more seasonal ice pack, as Julian said. But we do see maybe high regions of deformation over the shelf, these regions that are actually really important for the climate system. And so maybe we have some um, much higher drag coefficients there. Um, again, in con uh, for context, sea ice models used in global climate models all just assume a constant drag coefficient. Um, so yeah, this has a significant impact on mass balance, and we're still testing this too. And we're hoping to kind of calibrate some of these results with the measurements we're getting from IceBridge and ISAT too. Um, so I'll leave you my summary and take any questions. Okay, so time for a couple of quick questions. Tony has a question. Thank you. So uh, is the laser altimeter having a similar error characteristics as, as radar altimeter, like Cryosat 2 was this? Yeah, uh, it's, just, it's, it's slightly different. Yeah, you, you can tell I'm employed by NASA because I didn't mention Cryosat 2. Um, but uh, yeah, so Cryosat 2 is a radar altimeter, so it penetrates through that snow layer. Um, I think Ron and Juliana probably better serve to answer that question. I don't really use Cryosat 2 data much. Um, again, because it's measuring the ice freeboard instead of the total freeboard, your uncertainty estimates are slightly different. Um, I wouldn't particularly say one is better than the other. <laughs> Don't, they both need snow, essentially, yeah. So. 
Oh, I, I think it's a similar, similar? similar kind of similar kind of idea. Thank you. Yeah. So, so this is maybe a question for the Arctic as well. But mm -hmm. are there plans for in situ observations of the snow depth? Good question. <laughs> yeah. So I think I mentioned that in the in the, in the paper I submitted. Um, not particularly, no. And I've, you know, Torsten, who who was co-author on this talk, is, is the project scientist of ISAT two, and um, you know, we talked about that issue recently. Um, not particularly, no. And, that, and that's what is going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, and I think one of the open questions is, can we calibrate ISAT two just by looking at the Arctic? So there, there are kind of field campaigns that are always kind of happening in the Arctic from some of the Europeans and some of the some of the Americans and Canadians. And is that good enough to kind of calibrate what the laser is seeing? Um, or do we need a kind of dedicated Antarctic field campaign too? Um, I think that would be nice, but I don't really have the answer to that. It's definitely something to discuss. OK, I think we'll uh, move on to our final speaker, Aaron Donahue. So Aaron will talk about what processes drive southern ocean ice, uh, sea ice variability and trends. Okay, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here today, and thank you for staying awake. Um, so today I want to think about the signature of ice loss events on the large-scale energy budget of the southern ocean. I'll argue that analysis of the energy budget can provide insights into the mechanisms responsible for sea ice loss, specifically the... Um, the process that's responsible for adding energy to the atmosphere prior to an ice loss event is the initiator of sea ice loss events. Uh, I'll talk primarily about the Southern Ocean, but I'll provide some results from the Arctic uh, to put, put that in context. And I will talk entirely about the interannual variability as opposed to talking about the trends. The idea there is that the signal to noise ratio is much bigger. Uh, you get much, much more signal from the interannual variability. The downfall of that technique is that the mechanisms responsible for their year-to-year -year variability might not be the same as those responsible for the long-term trend. I would argue, however, that uh, if we can compare the model simulations of the year-to-year -year variability with what we see in observations, we get a sense of whether or not the models are adequately representing the system. Okay, so to start this talk, uh, I'm going to talk about the climatological energy budget of the Antarctic. Um, the main idea here being that, uh, and I define that as the region poleward to 55 degrees south, you could subtract out what's happening at 70 south, the area between 55 and 70, um, uh, you get almost the same result. The main idea here is that this is a region of net rated of loss, and that rated of loss must be balanced by energy input, either by atmospheric circulation or oceanic circulation. So we'll get some numbers. The incident solar radiation is about 212 watts per meter squared, about half uh, the global average and a full 116 watts per meter squared, about 54% of that gets reflected back um, to the top of the atmosphere. I'll talk about how the clouds and the surface each contribute to that number and how that varies from year to year with sea ice loss events. Uh, that leaves a net of about 100 watts per meter squared. The emitted long wave radiation is 186 watts per meter squared, so less than the global average, but much bigger than the absorbed solar radiation. This leaves a deficit of about 90 watts per meter squared in the region. Uh, now, the estimates I'll make today are going to show that the atmospheric energy input in the climatology is about 74 watts per meter squared. That's the so-called F-wall term. Uh, that's an ERA reanalysis or 68 in NSEP reanalysis. The missing term in that budget is the surface heat flux. The technique I'm going to use here is I'm going to define that, uh, diagnose that as the residual of the other terms, meaning what happens at the top of the atmosphere minus what happens in the atmosphere. I'm going to assume that that is the surface heat flux. The reason there is that the surface heat flux direct observations are fairly sparse, uh, so we think this is probably the best technique to get at that. Um, I'm sure that will upset many in this community, and I would love to hear what you guys would say in terms of whether there's other reasons or um, other ways we can get at that number. Now, in the annual mean, that surface heat flux has to be balanced by an input of energy in the ocean. We diagnose that to be about 16 watts per meter squared. In petawatts, that's about 0 0.7 petawatts. Uh, which seems to be, from my read on the literature, the higher end on, of uh, estimates, but within the range of what you might expect. Um, we can compare and contrast this to what happens. Okay, so first question I want to ask, are, are these estimates, this uh, 16 watts per meter squared uh, input via the ocean, is that uh, consistent with observations? Uh, you might say that I'm diagnosing this over the satellite area. What's the role of ocean heat storage? Uh, I'll pop that up real quick. 
the ocean heat storage in that region is about one yada joule per decade. That translates to about one watts per meter squared. So that's not a significant contributor to this problem. Um, I want to compare and contrast this picture with what's happening in the Arctic. I'm referencing here the study of Ceres in uh, 2007, where they defined the Arctic as polar 70 degrees north, so not quite apples to apples comparison here, but they found very similar numbers. You have a net rate of deficit of about 110 watts per meter squared, primarily balanced by the energy input via the F wall in the atmosphere, and very secondarily by the oceanic uh, input. Now, what I want to think about in this talk is how these numbers vary across ice loss events. Um, I think if there's anything we've learned in the atmospheric dynamics community in the last decade, it's that the atmosphere is incredibly efficient at moving energy between the different portions of the climate system. Um, th where that efficiency is defined relative to the efficiency of radiative processes, meaning if you put a chunk of energy in the atmosphere, the vast majority of that is going to be moved within the atmosphere as opposed to radiated back to space. Now, the relevant energetic quantity from the perspective of atmospheric dynamics is the moist static energy. That is the latent energy plus the sensible energy. Uh, so if you think about that, if you had equal units temperature perturbation in the tropics versus the high latitudes, you're going to amplify the impact of, on the atmospheric circulation in the tropics by a factor of three or four just because of the presence of moisture in the tropics. Uh, in this sense, you can think of the, this F wall term as being a tug of war between tropical processes and high latitude processes. If I put a given uh, energy perturbation in the tropics, it's going to want to push energy into the high latitudes. If I heat up the Arctic atmosphere, it's, wanna, it's going to want to push energy back out to the low latitudes. And I want to think about how that interchange between those two regions plays out in the observed variability. So uh, to make that concept more concrete, I'm going to propose three different mechanisms of sea ice loss. Um, and I'm going to think about how each of those has a, has a signature in the energetic budget of the high latitudes. The three different mechanisms will be sea ice loss initiated by oceanic processes, ice loss initiated by atmospheric processes, thinking about tropical variability driving high latitude sea ice response and radiative processes. So I start thinking about sea ice loss driven by oceanic processes. Let's say we have a change in the stratification of the ocean or a change in the lateral energy fluxes within the ocean that somehow melts the sea ice. As a result, you're exposing the warm ocean to the relatively colder atmosphere. This is particularly true in the winter, and you'll have an upward surface heat flux into the atmosphere. You'll thereby heat up the atmosphere, which will push energy uh, out to space in the radiation and primarily push energy back to the low latitudes through this F wall term. Uh, now, I'll argue that there's evidence for this mechanism, sea ice loss, in some couple of climate models. Here I'm showing a result from one particular model. It's an unforced simulation. I'm showing a composite around an ice loss event and I'm showing the energy flux anomalies associated with uh, that event. The blue line, positive values being energy input into the atmosphere, is showing that preceding the ice loss event on the left axis there, you are putting energy into the atmosphere uh, that continues through the ice loss event and thereafter, and the primarily, primary, primary balance there is losing the energy through this F wall term. So this seems to support this mechanism here that I've showed of Southern Ocean sea ice loss. Uh, the second mechanism I'll talk about is, say, we're initiating these ice loss events in the low latitudes, putting energy into the tropical atmosphere, moving that energy into the high latitudes, thereby heating up the atmosphere. As you heat up the atmosphere, you're going to push energy down into the surface. You do this by enhancing the downwell and long wave flux, also by reducing the turbulent energy fluxes at the surface. Uh, you're also fluxing energy out to space. Uh, here on the right panel, I'm showing a different climate model that seems to support this mechanism of sea ice loss. Preceding the ice loss event, you have an increase in this F wall term, the energy flux into the region. Uh, that energy is going, getting pushed into the surface. You also see some of it being dissipated via radiation. Okay, lastly, we can think about ice loss events being driven by radiative processes. That is to say that either changes in clouds or an initial sea ice perturbation is leading to an enhanced absorbed shortwave radiation within the region, which warms the atmosphere and pushes energy into the surface. Uh, as you warm the atmosphere, you'd also push some of that energy back into the tropics. And I'm showing a third climate model that seems to support this mechanism of sea ice loss. Preceding the sea ice loss event, you have an increase in radiation coming into the system. Uh, that's pushed into the surface primarily and somewhat uh, out to the atmospheric heat transport to the low latitudes. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that each of these mechanisms has a very different signature in the energy budget associated with the sea ice loss event. I also hope I've convinced you that these, this diversity of 
different mechanisms of sea ice loss is represented in different climate models. What we'd like to be able to do is to use the observations to be able to constrain which of these models is adequately representing the observed system. And I should say, if you look at all the CMIP-5 class models, it's about equal number in each of these categories uh, that I've outlined here. Um, so we'd like to have an observational estimate of these same processes. I'm not going to be able to get there today. Um, what's hidden in all of these analyses here is there's a large zonal structure to each of these fluxes. Uh, Although that, if you look at that zonal structure, uh, the details of it, it does support these interpretations, it, it's hard to get at the observations. What I want to do in my remaining time is to think about the relative magnitude of the interannual variability of each of these different terms. Uh, so I'll start by presenting those numbers, uh, then I'll talk about how we're deriving those numbers and the processes that go into determining these magnitudes. So what I'm showing here is just the magnitude of the interannual variability, so no sign. I'm trying to show the arrows in each direction. Uh, the top of the atmosphere radiation, two sigma, two standard deviations is 3.4 watts per meter squared, average over the Southern Ocean. The atmospheric storage is 2.2 watts per meter squared, uh, surprising that it's almost comparable in magnitude to the radiative variability. Uh, the big term here is this F wall term, which varies by 15.5 watts per meter squared. Now, we're deducing the surface fluxes as the residual of each of these terms, so it's just what's left over. Uh, this analysis uh, suggests that the dominant balance is between F wall, the atmospheric energy flux, and energy moving into the surface, with the rate of anomalies being significantly smaller. This in itself suggests that sea ice loss events cannot be driven by radiative processes, just because that number is so much smaller than those other numbers. Uh, now, the, the interesting piece is whether the F wall is leading to surface flux, heat fluxes, initiating sea ice loss, or if that relationship is the opposite. Okay, so how do we get these numbers? Uh, F wall we're diagnosing from NSEP and ERA reanalysis. Basically, we take the six hourly fields, we integrate zonally and vertically to get the total heat flux, the flux of more static energy. Top of the atmosphere radiation is coming from series EBAF product. It's only available since 2000 to present day. Uh, atmospheric storage is also from NSEP reanalysis, and again, the surface heat fluxes are a residual of the atmospheric energy budget. Uh, I want to compare and contrast these numbers to what we see in the Arctic, so same diagram for the Arctic, and you see a pretty similar story. The rate of variability is a little bit bigger in the Arctic, as is the atmospheric heat storage. F wall is almost exactly the same. So again, in the Arctic, we see this similar uh, balance between the surface heat fluxes and the atmospheric heat transport. Okay, so in the remaining time, what I want to focus on is what determines the magnitude of this rate of variability and the variability in this F wall term. So I'll start by thinking about the rate of variability. We're thinking about the radiation that's reflected uh, that it, you see at the top of the atmosphere, and I'll primarily focus on the solar component. Uh, so when we think about the radiation at the top of the atmosphere, how that's influenced by both the clouds and the surface, this is the picture I have in mind. You have solar in radiation incident at the top of the atmosphere, some portion of that is going to be reflected off the top of clouds. Some will be transmitted to the surface where it's reflected, then transmitted back through the atmosphere and uh, re returned back to space. So in this sense, the re reflection off of clouds is a one-step process. You just have to reflect the incident radiation, whereas the reflection off the surface is a three-step process. You have to get the radiation down, reflect it at the surface, and then get the radiation back up. So we'd like to be able to figure out how each of these uh, the, the clouds and the surface is contributing to the top of the atmosphere radiative budget. Uh, to do that, I'm going to introduce a, a simple model. This is an isotropic single model. I'll explain the model and then talk about how this helps us answer the question. So we're going to assume that S, solar radiation, is incident at the top of the atmosphere, and that A percent is going to be absorbed within the atmosphere column, R reflected back to space. The remainder, 1 minus R minus A, the atmosphere transmissivity, is transmitted to the surface, and then a portion of that given by the surface albedo is going to be reflected back uh, up to the top of the atmosphere. We're then going to repeat that process going upwards, 8% of that absorbed within the column, R percent reflected back, the remainder transmitted to the top of the atmosphere. Uh, within this model, we have two contributions to the reflected radiation on the top of the atmosphere, the direct reflection off the clouds and the reflection off the surface, which is modified by the atmospheric transmissivity squared squared because you had to get that radiation down to the surface, reflect it, and then get it back up. If we think about a couple of limits, if uh, the atmosphere is completely transparent, then 
from the perspective of the top of the atmosphere, you just see the surface albedo, which is saying if, saying if you can see the surface unimpeded from the top of the atmosphere, the surface albedo is the planetary albedo. In contrast, if R equals 1, if you're sitting on top of the atmosphere and you cannot see the surface, it doesn't matter what the surface looks like from a climate perspective. And I'll argue that that limit is, uh, we're closer to that limit in the observed climate system, especially in the high latitudes than the other limit. Okay, so how do we use this information? If we know the values of R and A along with the surface value, we can solve for these two terms. What we have is we have the radio fluxes at the top of the atmosphere and the surface from series, so we can invert the process solving for R and A and then back out these answers. Uh, one detail is that we can continue this indefinitely, which is what we do. Uh, that's just a detail that actually turns out to be fairly important in the high latitudes where you can get these multiple reflections off the surface and off of clouds. Okay, so here's the results for the climatology uh, in the Antarctic. Here we're dividing the planetary albedo of 54% into an atmospheric contribution here amounts to a domain average of 40% and a surface contribution which amounts to a domain average of 14% saying that the vast majority of the planetary albedo of the high latitudes in the Antarctic it, it is due to the uh, cloud reflection as opposed to the surface reflection. Um, I'm going to flip to the Arctic, and we see a pretty similar story. The only place that really contributes to the radiative processes is, is Greenland here and the Antarctic continent here. Okay, so next what we want to think about is how this varies from year to year associated with the sea ice loss event. Uh, here I'm showing the results from the Antarctic, and the blue contours is showing you, uh, these are composites around an ice loss event. The blue contours are showing you the ice loss, the change in the surface albedo, and then the red coloring is showing you the change in absorbed shortwave radiation. Just as you'd expect, you see an enhanced absorbed shortwave radiation. I should say the left panel is the surface contribution, and the right panel is the atmospheric or the cloud contribution. Uh, so you see an enhanced absorbed shortwave radiation associated with the surface albedo feedback here. It amounts to about 1.9 watts per meter squared. That is countered by the change in clouds. That is, as you melt the sea ice, you enhance the cloudiness of the region, and in a domain average, that contributes in the negative sense, one watt per meter squared, a net of 0.9. Uh, the change in OR is fairly small, and what we get is a net of about 0.9 watts per meter squared. Now, you'll note that that's smaller than what I uh, showed you before. I think it was of order 3 watts per meter squared, which is to say that not all of the radiative variability is associated with sea ice loss events. Um, okay, so in the uh, Antarctic, we have uh, surface albedo and cloud effects counteracting each other. If we flip to the Arctic, we actually see the opposite situation over the observed record. Uh, here, you can see the ice loss right along the sea ice edge there. Uh, the surface contributions of planetary albedo is isolated to those regions right there. It has a domain average of 1.3. But what we see is that if we look at the cloud contribution to the absorbed shortwave radiation, we actually see an anomaly of the same sign, more absorbed shortwave radiation. And we haven't diagnosed what's going on here. Um, what this result suggests is that uh, some studies have tried to back out the surface albedo from the observed satellite record by regressing the change in ice uh, concentration against the change in top of the atmosphere radiation. Those studies have probably confused some cloud variability, uh, co-variability of the clouds with the ice concentrations with the direct impact of the surface albedo anomalies. How much time do we have? Uh, two, minutes. two minutes. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> So we. Um, uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is this F wall term. Um, this is an overly complicated slide of how we ca calculate this. The concept here is that we just have a wall in longitude and height, and we're keeping track of all of the energy that moves poleward and all of the energy that moves equatorward. Uh, we can gain some more insight into how that works by decomposing the circulations into different. Uh, different classes of circulation, if you will. The idea there is that in order to move energy into one region, you have to have a contrast of the energy of the air flowing in one direction versus that flowing in the opposite direction. And you can have that contrast in the vertical, which would be associated with an overturning circulation. You can have it, uh, that contrast in energy in the longitudinal direction associated with a stationary wave, or you can have a temporal covariance between the velocities and the energy associated with the passing baroclinic disturbance. So what we've done here is we've decomposed, I'm showing DJF, this is the vertically integrated, the heat fluxes into these different contributions. You see in the deep tropics, the overturning circulation contributes a lot. Uh, that overturning circulation counters the total heat transport, the polar heat transport in the mid-latitudes in the feral cell. 
The red line is the stationary waves. You see those popping up in the northern hemisphere, mid-latitudes associated essentially with uh, either mountain waves or the land-ocean heat contrast. Um, and you see in the southern hemisphere, the total heat transport in black is primarily composed by the transient eddies. Uh, now, what I want to focus on is we can look at the vertical structure of these energy fluxes within the atmosphere. And in these upper panels, I'm showing you two different quantities. In color is the sensible heat fluxes as a function of latitude and altitude. And in colors is the latent heat fluxes or the moisture fluxes. I think we see uh, a really interesting picture, especially in the Arctic, is that we have these really large stationary eddies that are in the lower troposphere but actually peak up in the stratosphere. And if you calculate this, you find that in the climatology, about 20% of the heat flux is occurring above the tropopause in the stratosphere. And I'd argue that this has a very different impact on surface climate than a low-level energy flux, because that energy is primarily going to be radiated into space as opposed to impacting the surface. Uh, to some extent, you've seen the same story in the transient eddies. Um, those are primarily loaded in the lower atmosphere, but there's a significant contribution in the upper atmosphere. So I'm going to flip, this will probably be my last slide, to think about the interannual variability of this F wall. And we see in the stratosphere of both hemispheres, we see the stationary eddies and transient eddies pop up, um, which is to say that even though the climatology in the Southern Ocean is dominated by the transient eddies, just as you'd expect, the stationary eddies, and especially the stationary eddies in the, in the stratosphere, are contributing signif significantly to those energy fluxes. So the idea here is that uh, if we can somehow find a more clever way to think about these energy fluxes instead of just vertically and zonally integrating them, we might get a clearer connection between the energy fluxes and the sea ice anomalies. Okay, uh, I think I will, yeah, I'll stop. <laughs> I'll, I'll just flip to conclusions there. Thank you.